Ben, bonjour. Uh, it's, uh, it's nice to be here with you. Uh, ma présentation va être en anglais, mais si jamais vous avez des questions en, en français, c'est correct. Uh, des fois, j'avais manqué un peu de terminologie, mais je vais essayer mon mieux de, de répondre. Donc, uh, anyways, it's, uh, it's nice to be here with you and uh, have this opportunity to share some of the work I've done. Uh, Big thank you to the presenters that came before for setting the stage. Uh, uh, also to the Université de Montréal for uh, hosting this event. And uh, yeah, all those who work behind the scenes uh, to make this conference a reality. Les interprètes que je trouve génial, c'est tout un talent que je ne serais jamais capable de faire. En tout cas, so... Uh, the title of my work and uh, presentation is uh, Border Crossings and Discourse Spaces, uh, Creating Spatial Identities Through Translations of Blockheads, Potatoes, and Fish Soup. And it's based on my recent experience of uh, translating from English into French, uh, an illustrated picture book that's called uh, Blockhead, The Life of Fibonacci. And uh, in this book, it celebrates the life of the Italian mathematician uh, Leonardo Fibonacci. So, and without further ado, um, language, as you are well aware, uh, provides humans with the capacity to share knowledge and past experiences, but it also allows us to create and unlock spaces for discourse that can empower and expose people to worlds that would otherwise go unnoticed. So let's take Blockhead, for example. The purpose of this book is to share what Fibonacci has contributed to humanity and the power of magic and magic of mathematics. So I imagine myself as just a young teenager reading this book for the first time and being exposed to the ideas and thinking, well, you know, math's cool, but uh, it, it might have been enough for me to decide to choose a career in math. But uh, anyways, we all find ourselves here together. Um, so I personally find it powerful to consider that words can go that far beyond a page and have such an impact. And that, as a side note too, this is also very interesting from a pedagogical standpoint for its capacity to inspire. Um, so and then this work, uh, my work demonstrates that the, the importance of creating spatial identities and how this can be accomplished even in translation. So however, this can only be accomplished if cultural and socially identifiable spaces for thought are created. And it's, for, uh, it's within these spaces that transdisciplinary and translinguistic thought intersect. So as you will see, I've sprinkled this presentation with a few images, uh, most of which exemplify some of Fibonacci's ideas. Like the rose, for example, reflects how things in nature grow according to a set pattern, which has now become known as the golden ratio. Uh, this work considers that choices either produce or reproduce context-specific discourse spaces, and that syntactical and lexicological obstacles to creating spatial identity do exist, but, can be overcome is the, if the goal is to create an identifiable piece of work. Uh, unfortunately, however, and as you will see in this presentation, there were times when circumstances dictated that a lexicological void be created uh, because an exact equivalent could not be rendered in French. <clears throat> so as hinted by uh, Holland et al. in 2001, in 2001, language is the tool with which humans express their identity and foster spatially defined cultures to create a sense of collective. Uh, it is the apparatus that unites us and enables the cultivation of ideas. <clears throat> Excuse me. Uh, so this work demonstrates how translation involves considerations of identity based on semantics and semiotics, and then how stylistic choices reflect spatial identities and relationships for readers to either align with, to be inspired by, or to reject entirely. Uh, translating picture books about uh, mathematicians uh, occasions the creation of sociocultural spaces for discourse. And just so we're, I guess we're all on the same page, uh, Mercer defines sociocultural discourse analysis as a methodology for understanding, quote, how people use talk to think together, end quote, and I, guess through extension and maybe possibly due to ignorance, I'm not sure, uh, take the word talk to reflect uh, all means of human, human communication. Uh, so I guess elaborating on these ideas, uh, these discourse spaces are where theoretical and empirical uh, studies and learning theories, identity theories, and mathematics education intersect at the crossroads 
of transdisciplinary and translinguistic thought. Tout une sentence, tout une phrase de Dieu. Um, so in more specific terms, this work focuses on the way translation reflects choices uh, within sociocultural frameworks and how such choices will produce or reproduce context-specific discourse spaces. So defining the target audience in a relatable space was critical during the translation uh, from English into French of this children's picture book. Um, doing this, doing so ensures that information is transferred according to the pertinent location specific language of the reader and in turn uh, ensures the greatest amount of comprehension, retention and relatability. And so whether destined for uh, Quebec or for France, uh, spatially defined social societal conventions needed to be addressed and cultural voids needed to be avoided or at the very worst to be filled. So an attempt has been made to surface and explain the subtle differences between the French using Quebec and the one employed in France. So in this presentation, I'll discuss only two of them. Uh, so Leonardo Fibonacci's nickname and the subtle differences between types of fish soup. So importantly, and in a practical and theoretical sense, uh, the same rules of would apply for translating source text into any other target language. So the objective of translating a blockhead was to produce an equivalent text that specifically adapted in terms of thought and imagery to the qualitatively different language context particular to Quebec. And during translation, uh, various uh, syntactical and lexicological obstacles to creating spatial identity uh, were identified. And then a case in point, in the English text, Fibonacci's nickname is Blockhead from the Italian Bigolo, which describes the qualities of wanderer, or idler, or dreamer. And, uh, but by far the biggest challenge when translating this book into French was how to translate Blockhead, as a decision would have rippling effects. And not only on the surface, on a comprehension or meaning level, but also on the co-constructions of young readers' identities as learners of mathematics. So meaning that the impression of a reader could impact whether a young person comes to love mathematics, make it a lifelong pursuit, or whether the reader, reader will have a negative impression and that would persist till the end of their days. So a literal translation of blockhead would uh, produce tête carré, which um, I guess would be understood as a derogatory term for uh, Anglophones in Quebec. So, and then new, um, uh, the numerous other options were considered, uh, including uh, rêveur, uh, imbecile, idiot. Uh, and then even looked at the, the Spanish translation where they use a uh, soñador, which is uh, a dreamer. Um, but regrettably, none of these terms were in line with the accompanying illustrations or seemed uh, simply just too mean-spirited. And so using the work of Vene and Darbonne, which uh, we just heard about uh, not too long ago, uh, to guide further analysis. Uh, Blockhead identified as the signifier and spit or imbecile as the signified. Patet was acknowledged as a relevant sign as it is less offensive than idiot or imbecile, but yet it shares similar characteristics and intonations as the other terms previously considered. And it also creates a similar reaction or response in the reader. Plus, uh, I guess on a purely personal level, I found it more youth, youth friendly and uh, rather playful. So should be noted too that uh, you know, Blockhead also alludes to Fibonacci's mathematical work, which is this is a very important aspect as this picture book could, you know, as we already talked about have an influence on children and how uh, you know, the power of mathematics is explained to them. Um, so, however, no way has been found to adequately express this nuance in French. So a uh, lexicological void was created because a portion of the English meaning and what it is referring to in its entirety cannot be completely expressed. So, you know, we've already talked about the golden ratio and that Blockhead also alludes to his mathematical, Fibonacci's mathematical work, but, and I guess, and his contribution to science and our understanding of the world we inhabit. Uh, but here we can see an example of Fibonacci himself uses to explain the golden ratio 
and how it manifests itself in the real world. I guess this is uh, done through the enumeration of uninhibited rabbit reproduction. Uh, here the red lines separate the years, the black rabbits represent a reproductive care, and the orange ones represent little newborn bunnies. So if this continues on and uninhibited, we can see where this could go. Uh, so anyways, continuing on, uh, no way has been found to adequately express this, uh, the mathematical uh, content in a reference in, in French. So this creates a lexicological void. But just because there's a void that has been created, it doesn't mean that the translation is void of meaning. So I would argue that it's quite the contrary, simply based on the fact that a given word already has a connotation. So therefore, no total void in meaning could ever exist. Um, and at the most basic level, the meaning will just take on a similar role as to that found in the source text. So another thought-provoking translation challenge was how to translate fish soup. Uh, fish soup in the source text alludes to the author's either perceived or intended notion that France did not have much to contribute to mathematics nor to gastronomy at that time. Uh, so reading directly from the English source text, when I got older, my father sometimes sent me on business trips. When I wasn't working, I sought out wise men in every city. In Egypt, I learned how the ancient pharaohs and their subjects had used fractions. In Greece, I learned about geometry from ancient books of math. In Sicily, I put my division and subtraction skills to good use. In France, well, well, in France, I ate fish soup. And uh, to address this, uh, bouillabaisse, uh, it's a famous French soup from the south of France, uh, was immediately considered just because I love it. Anyways, uh, upon reflection, I decided that this could have led to a, an unrelatable or unidentifiable term because the culturally specific vocabulary might, might not necessarily be known to it's all Quebecois and Quebecois. So uh, continuing on though, this could possibly be interpreted as a reflection of social hierarchy as well. And I also wanted to express that uh, the disappointment and disgust. So also this could possibly be taken as an insult to someone from France. So especially when the illustration from the book is considered. Uh, so my final, final translation was uh, en France, en fait, en France, j'ai mangé de la soupe poisson. So uh, as a side note, this translation hurdle exemplifies that word choice is dependent on the intentions of the translator in terms of conceptual choices each conveying a meaning and or illusion specific to the individual reader's point in time. So, uh, yeah, in conclusion, uh, choices matter and they have a direct impact on social acceptance uh, and whether the next generation will become inspired enough to, to dedicate their time to the advancement of uh, mathematics and, and use it to contribute to society at a large um, so these points exemplify that translating uh, picture books about uh, mathematicians lends itself to the creation of uh, sociocultural spaces for discourse related to how people use communication um, as the means to allowing us to think together. And uh, yeah, that's, about, that's the end of my presentation.